Hi, I'm Saki. Welcome to episode three of Coronavirus Crafts. Today, I'm going to show you how to feel rocks. When we're done, we will have felt rocks. Felt rocks. These are just rocks that are covered in felt, as one might guess. Parents, are you having issues getting your kids to wash their hands? This is a great activity that will get them to wash their hands with soap, with hot water for 10 whole minutes. Not 10 seconds, 10 minutes. You heard that correctly. It's also a really therapeutic activity. I've taught art classes to autistic kids. They love this. I mean, I love it. And if you can't tell, I'm what they would call on the spectrum. <laughs> anyway, so for supplies, you're gonna need three things. A rock, some wool, and soap. So I assume you have a sink with hot running water, but you know, that's like my first world privileged assumption. I guess not everyone has access to hot running water, so I guess there are four supplies, the fourth one being hot running water. So for the rock, the ideal size is something like this, like a bar of soap or something, a small bar of soap. Make sure you get a smooth one. We don't want any sharp cutting edges because we're trying to make a sweater, not a scabbard. For the wool, this stuff is merino wool roving. I got this from Gray Fox Felting on Etsy. They're not paying me to advertise. They don't even know that I'm plugging their shop. I'm just telling you where I bought this from and it's good stuff. So I want to bring them more business. So I'm just going to get some wool here. I'm using these three colors, put these guys aside. So we're just going to take some wool and construct a little tortilla for our rock burritos. So just peel off a little tuft and then lay it down on the counter. It's very important that you're pulling off the tuft just with your fingers, kind of be gentle. Pull off the tuft. You don't want to cut it. Do not cut. Do not cut the tuft. If you cut them, they will all end at the same length, and this is going to form a really obvious edge on the final product. It's going to form a very visible ridge. It's going to stick out like sequential bills in a drug deal. So make one thin layer like this, and then we're going to make a second layer on top of that. And you want the second layer to be perpendicular to the first layer. This is pretty important. If you lay them, if you lay them all in the same direction, and then you tried felting them, you would just end up with like a, a pile of yarn. There's just they're gonna form little strands going this way instead of interlocking. So unless you want your rock to be scantily clad in like little bondage yarn like that, make sure their sweaters have a warp and a weft. Also, really important. Make sure you fluff out the tufts a bit here so you don't get localized bunching. Um, here, let me show you an example of localized bunching. So on this rock, I didn't fluff my tufts out. And this little strand right here, um, this little wrap around, you can tell when I uh, wiggle it around, it's kind of its, its own little unit. It didn't want to join the union. It formed its own little sovereign state. There's kind of a little ridge right there. I don't want to peel it off because that's going to exasperate the problem. but. Yeah. So now it's time to check the size of your tortilla. Place your rock right on there and try to wrap up that burrito and see if you get full coverage. Make sure there's no holes. So that's, that looks like enough. Um, check over the whole thing. Make sure that there's no bald spot there. If, if you have any bald spots, add a little toupee, okay? At this point, many of the tutorials I've seen suggest that you stuff this whole ensemble into an old pantyhose. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't actually, I don't personally know anyone who just has spare pantyhose lying around. So I'm going to show you how to do it without pantyhose. After you wrap your burrito, palm it, grab the whole thing. Like We're going to run this under hot water. So if you're a wuss, you can start out with colder water and then gradually increase the temperature. You can just kind of lower it a little bit at a time as you get, as you get used to it, but I'm just going to go for it. All right. This is the old, the old boiled frog concept, um, which is a myth by the way, but we can talk about that later. So stick your hand and the rock under the hot water until the whole thing is soaked. Very important to uh, keep it sheltered because 
the, the water will actually pierce a hole in this little layer of wool. Alright, out of the pot. Right now the wool is a soggy mess and it's not really clinging to the rock. So for the next like 10 minutes we're gonna shrink this sweater. Next, grab some soap. Go ahead and pat it all over. Um, you can use bar soap but you have to lather it first. I'm using liquid soap because it's convenient and it's what I have. Okay, so go ahead and pat that soap all over. Don't don't be smearing it around, okay? Just pat it on. The wool's really fragile right now and you'll end up just ripping a hole in it. Alright, so next you're gonna start squeezing the rock gently from every direction. You're gonna just squeeze it without sliding it around too much um, and then keep rotating the rock as you do it. So while you're squeezing, make sure that you're avoiding these floppy flip-flops here because you, you don't want to be making these. these if you make a wrinkle, it's going to fold over itself and that little crease, that belly fat right there, that fat roll is going to it's going to it's not going to go away later. It's going to form some scar tissue. It's going to form a scar like stretch marks. So when you get a wrinkle, spread that out right away and comp and compress it downward without making new wrinkles. So, when you get a wrinkle, you get a wrinkle, redistribute it. Alright, keep rotating it. So we're trying to compress the wool and tighten up the fibers. It's a very similar process to kneading bread dough, at least at the, at, at the molecular level. We're basically trying to encourage interactions between the strands of fibers, the strands of wool, because each interaction is an opportunity for entanglement. And it's the entanglement that knits together the sweater. With bread dough, the kneading process develops the gluten in much the same way. So wheat flour has these two proteins called gliadin and glutelin. And when these two proteins meet each other, they form a polymer called gluten. Polymer is a fancy way of referring to a big molecule made of smaller molecules. Uh, but felt is not a wool polymer because the strands are not covalently bonded to each other. Science. So at this point, we're, we're still just compressing it together. It's getting a little bit tighter now. It's, it's not forming as many uh, flaps, but it's, it's, still, it's still not completely tight. Like you can see when I just squeezed it, I just squoze it, and that part it formed a little air bubble right there. All right, back to the science talk. All right, I'm gonna explain to you how felting works. Wool is like human hair. It has microscopic scales covering each strand. Each strand looks like a tiny dragon or a snake or something If you, when you look at it under a microscope. These scales, which are also known as cuticles, uh, not like these cuticles, so they fluff up and, and unfold when it gets hot and then when it gets cold they fold back in again and get smooth. This is why you can have bad hair days and good hair days. It's because the weather is is reshaping your hair structure. Depending on the temperature and humidity, your hair will be different levels of floof and, and different levels of getting tangled with itself -ness. And this is why you need to use 100% wool. Synthetic fibers and plant fibers like bamboo yarn or, or teddy bear guts are just not gonna work because they don't have the microscopic scales. Have you ever seen a synthetic wig have a bad hair day? Wait, actually, some people don't know about proper wig care, so the answer might be yes, so forget I said that. Anyway, you gotta use actual wool from sheep or goat or alpaca or... I mean, actually, you could use human hair to do felting also. It, it does work, but human hair is really thick, so the final product will feel more like a Brillo pad instead of a fuzzy sweater. Um, plus, it's a little creepy, so... So now we're at the point where it's not really forming wrinkles anymore. Like, I squeeze it and there's like a little ridge, but there's no wrinkles. Um, so, and this, the sweater is looking pretty sturdy, so, and we're no longer in danger of ripping a hole in it, so you can start treating this kind of like a bar of soap and scrubbing it back and forth and rotating it. 
This is actually why it's important to use soap. The soap is acting as a lubricant so that you can slide the wool fibers around without having them grip onto your hands and ripping holes. It also helps the individual strands slide around and mingle better so that they're more likely to get tangled with each other. Lube increases the likelihood of individuals' strands interacting with each other and becoming attached. Where was I on the felting science? Right, hair and cuticles. So um, the cuticles, the little scales, they open up when it gets hot, which is why it's important to use hot water. It makes the fibers more likely to latch onto each other. Also, another thing that makes the cuticles open up is extreme pH. So above pH 8 or below pH 4. Um, in case you weren't paying attention in chemistry class, pH 7 is neutral. So anything below a 7 is acidic and then anything above a 7 is basic. Not like basic bitch basic. It's like an acid or a base. A, a base is an opposite of an acid and basic is the opposite of acidic. I'm an acidic bitch. So water has a pH of 7. According to Google, most soaps have a pH of 7 to 9, but if you have a if you have a neutral soap, you should still use it because like I, I mentioned earlier, uh, the lubricating properties of soap make it very important for felting. Alright, I'm going to, so I feel like I'm not getting like optimal felting here, so I'm just going to rinse it under some more hot water. And at this point, it's totally safe to just like let the water run all over it. It's not going to dig a hole in the felt. Okay, um, so I rinsed off most of my soap. I'm just going to re-soap. Alright. Um, so I'm, I'm mostly kind of scrubbing it back and forth, but I'm still going to compress it a little bit. Oh yeah, we never got around to talking about that boiling frog thing. So, <laughs> in, in case you haven't heard of this legend before, um, the concept of a boiling frog is that if you put a, a frog in a pot of boiling water, it's going to immediately jump out. It's going to be like, oh dang, it's hot. Nope. But if you, take a, if you put a frog in cold water and then gradually raise the heat, um, supposedly, according to legend, They'll just hang out in there and not notice that it's changing until it's too late and then by the time they realize it, they, they'd be dead already. So, of course, uh, this is not true. Scientists have long debunked that myth. I mean, frogs ain't dumb. Like, when it's hot, they jump out. When it, when it gets warm, they jump out. But the expression stuck around. So when you're satisfied with how snug your pet rock sweater is, um, you can rinse it under cold water and wring out the soap. So this is going to restore it to pH 7 and um, the cold water will make the cuticles shrink back. So if you decide it's not snug enough, you can repeat the felting process. Otherwise, just rinse it with cold water and then you're done. So it's going to get a lot darker because you're rinsing out the soap bubbles, but uh, don't worry, it will... After it dries out, it's going to... Um, fluff back up. Oh no, there's a bald spot. Alright, I made it too thin there. It's hard to see because it's by the blue, the blue wool, but I think what I can do is kind of scoot everything up. It's too bad I tightened the sweater so hard. Alright, scoot everything up. Try to close up that hole. <laughs> I was too skimpy with the wool. And actually this side, this side's really thick. Maybe because I was... Wow, I've been washing my hands for like 10 minutes now. If I had coronavirus on my hands, it'd be dead. Alright, so just, uh, there's your rock. I let that dry overnight. 
Thanks for watching. For more of these tutorials and also tutorials on less useful things, uh, subscribe to my channel. According to legend, if you place a frog in hot water, it will jump right out. But if you put it in cold water and gradually heat it up, the frog will be like, oh yeah, it's chill, until it gets boiled to death. Okay, so this is actually untrue. Frogs just GTFO when it's too hot. But anyway, the expression is still used to describe scenarios where a threat is ignored because it's ramped up in small increments. For example, imagine you're some naive froggy back in 2010, and all of a sudden the government says, hey, hey, we're taking over the world. Everyone is under house arrest indefinitely. Your communication and contact with other humans will be monitored and regulated. We'll tell you what you're allowed to eat, where to shop, what music to listen to. Vaccines are now mandatory because we're engineering bioweapons. Those who resist will be terminated. You have no human rights. Okay, okay. So. So imagine that. Um, obviously, this would lead to some sort of epic global froggy uprising. Now, imagine this. You're a frog in 2010, and all of your friends are getting sucked into this world of Facebook and Instagram and Netflix. Socializing has now been reduced to liking a post or sharing a link. At first, people are creeped out by the ads generated by Facebook stalking their Amazon browsing history. but then they download ad blockers, and then it becomes a non-issue. Also in 2010, who even heard of a flu vaccine? It was just like, people got, people got the flu and then they got over the flu. But then, companies started paying for their employees to get it for free. And now when you say something is free, people get really excited. Everyone wants to get in on the deal. Year by year, it becomes the norm to get vaccinated. Vaccines are not mandatory, they're free. and all the other frogs are going to call you an idiot for not taking advantage of this, which means it's mandatory. And it's been such a long time that they've gotten sick that they freak out when they hear the news of this super flu that has no vaccine, oh my god. And then a nationwide lockdown happens and the froggies all lose their job. Nobody has time to look at the data and decide for themselves how deadly this flu is because they're all busy trying to buy toilet paper and file for unemployment. And it doesn't occur to any of these froggies that they're under house arrest either. No, it's not house arrest, it's shelter in place. Shelter for your own good. It's not imprisonment. You're free to go outside, except that the air is full of pathogens. Kind of like how factory farms free-range chickens are too chicken to go out into their range freely. Let's not get into that. Uh, let's get back to you, the modern-day froggy who's in a pot of hot but not quite boiling water. So at this point, all the restaurants and shops are closed. You can order food online, but only from certain restaurants. Social gatherings are limited to a size of zero. No more social gatherings. So at some point, so at some point, you and all these other froggies are going to realize that you've been duped. It's time for you to stand up against the authority. But how can you form a coalition if you can't have social gatherings? How do you spread the word? You could make a Facebook post, but that post would easily get removed. Like, you think they can't remove a post? You think they can't do that? So how do you coordinate an underground movement when your text messages are being monitored? That's how a frog gets spoiled. <clears throat> uh, okay, so that got kind of dark. That uh, escalated quickly. Wait, actually, it escalated gradually. Uh, so, that boiling frog story, it's not necessarily what I believe to be true, but I'm not gonna say it's impossible either. Here's something to consider. If all this blows over and the coronavirus drama does not end with totalitarian dystopia, what have we learned? How should we prepare for the real thing if we're lucky enough for this to be merely a foreshadowment? Let's give the government the benefit of the doubt and say that, okay, they're truly acting in our best interest. Even so, don't you think someone is observing all of this and thinking, wow, look at all this untapped power. Look how easy it is to gain control of the human race. Anyway, uh, I originally meant to teach you about felting rocks. So uh, let's talk about why we need soap. 